Uh, my name is Adrian Ocneanu. And uh, I uh, give a course uh, this semester on uh, the way to understand mathematical laws out of the structure of space and conversely on how to make mathematical laws to fill the space. So this is a plan Now, the dictionary here will be a mathematical form of quantum field theory. And uh, what we'll show is that the usual mathematical laws uh, are great, but they fill only two-dimensional space-time, one space, one time. As you know very well, many of you from uh, conformal field theory. Um, so we shall need to build some higher mathematics which hopefully will fill higher dimensional space-time in the physical number of dimensions. So basically do the same thing that's done in uh, conformal field theory, forget the conformal part, just the, the mathematics part of it, but for a physical number of dimensions. Now. Uh, the mathematical objects here will be built on symmetry. And this symmetry is to be interpreted physically as the internal symmetry of matter. So whenever we build a new kind of symmetry, it will be like a new kind of matter that fills the space. So uh, let me start a bit about, uh, about the structure. Yes, and uh, in particular about the structure of KFT. You see, when you do classical mechanics, you follow a pebble uh, that has a one-dimensional trajectory. The ambient space may be big, but the problem is essentially one-dimensional. Now, when you have at the other end today, when you have uh, uh, something like quantum field theory, you have a kind of magma and uh, uh, the basic laws will be conceptually very simple. You can just chop it into pieces. So QFT, like a magma, cut it into pieces. With boundary. So 
So once you have such a, such a piece, and the boundary can be quite, uh, quite interesting. So here you have the interior, and this is a boundary. Now, the boundary, you should be able to glue the boundary to the next piece. So this is an overview, really, of what will be done in the course with a lot of uh, rigor. And uh, I must say that uh, if you are expected compl complicated things that go to limit at infinity, where, where uh, this is not the cause for it. So here everything will be low dimensional combinatoric, though things will interact in a, in a very unusual kind of way. Very explicit. So let's say that you have another piece. Uh, the point is that here you have a vector space V. V is a Hilbert space. And here you have V bar because as you can see the same part of the boundary has opposite orientation, yes? And, uh, and here you have just the inner product or the trace for gluing. So that's the idea of gluing. Now, the main part of uh, quantum field theory is that it's uh, exponentiated. Uh, let me uh, go in, uh, in a minute or two upon uh, the exponentiation from physics. Is anyone from mathematics? I see. So maybe I should, uh, I should do that in a nutshell. You see, if you have... Uh, if you have three positions in a room, so this would be a very small room, you'll yes, say a, a pebble would be in one of the positions. Yes, a, uh, a quantum mechanics, a particle would be in all three. Yes, so it would be in a linear combination, C1, C2, C3, yes. These are numbers in C, and uh, all together you have a vector and uh, this vector, the length of this vector, the state actually, rho, the length of this uh, vector is 1. Yes, and, uh, and the squares of the coefficients, the module square, gives you the probabilities. That's why at some point in your chemistry, drawn as clouds rather than as planets. Now, when you go to... So this is one exponentiation. This is c to the power x. And now if you have uh, quantum field theory, at least in the free field, you have uh, uh, something like uh, 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 c plus direct sum with c uh, with v, direct sum with v tensor v over two factorial and uh, so on. Yes, now you recognize, so this is no particle. This is one particle, uh, two. Yes, and uh, this two factorial is a symmetric group on two points. So this means that the particles are indistinguishable. And you recognize that this is a series e to the v. Yes, if it's symmetric, a good exercise. And uh, from time to time, you will get uh, some nice exercises uh, to do as homework. Yes, one exercise is to, uh, to do the following. Uh, you can define uh, uh, e to the xi formally where xi is a vector in V. These e to the xi are some vectors, and they satisfy e to the xi times e to the eta is equal to e to the inner product xi eta. 
this is defined like this here. So that if you take here the symmetric tensor product, so this could be anti-symmetric. So if you take the symmetric these two constructions v to the v are the same. Yes? So write a vector e to the xi here. Use some differentiation to show that you can build exactly this space and the other way around. I, are there any questions on the problem? So two different bases. Very good. So now, uh, the idea here that I wanted to, to draw out of it is that we need to build mathematics which is exponential in behavior in nature. So it will have tensor products instead of direct sums. The problem uh, mathematically is that if you take this space uh, for only three points, uh, this is perfectly all right, but if you take this to be uh, some kind of L2 of, uh, of the room in which we are, uh, you will get big problems uh, building this. So what we need is to build some kind of space which behaves exponentially as if it was the exponential of a vector space, but which is not. Now, uh, let me make here a little parenthesis about the tensor product and direct sum. Uh, these are done uh, in a very uh, uh, way which is not the best introduced, and there's a problem for that even for professional mathematicians. Uh, the idea is very simple. You choose a basis, and for this, you, you get a... Uh, a Cartesian product of the bases, and for this you get the disjoint union. Yes, only after you, you think of it like this uh, should you prove that there is some universal construction at the beginning. That's much more complicated. So, due to this fact now, let's go back to our boundary. Uh, the boundary, if we have here some spaces V, V1, V2, V3, then the, we'll have a Hilbert space of the boundary. Let's say this is some manifold M, which will be V tensor V1, V bar here, tensor V1, tensor V2, and so on, portions of the boundary. And uh, they should match here. So the gluing is done by what you uh, learn in algebra is tensor product over an algebra, tensor product of modules, yes? So A is the piece of the boundary, so you have tensor over A, A1, A2. So the Abelian algebra is only to bother with it. If you work with bases, it means simply that the elements of A go from one to the other, <laughs> which is exactly the same as saying that the endpoints of this boundary should glue, should match. So this means that the end point. 
So now let us take a look at the inside of such a piece. What is happening inside? So Yes. Yes, yes. So the uh, in this particular case, thank you for the question. In this particular case, if you have some edges, yes, and here you have possible labels uh, A1, A2, and so on, and this is B1, B2, and so on for this other end, yes? This would be a vector space of the edge. So here you have xi, again, labels. So this would be an orthonormal basis of the space of H of the edge, yes? Here you will have an algebra which is C to the power to the set A1, A2, and so on. And something similar here. B, B1, B2. And the rule is simple that A times an edge A1 B xi is equal to the A is equal to Kronecker symbol of A and A1 times the edge. So the product is zero unless the endpoint matches. Yes? Now you can see that if you have such an algebra, and if you take the, so it's a very simple law. If you have such an algebra, it does exactly mathematically the gluing. Yes, because a label A has an element here, one plus zero plus zero, and so on. So this element A moves from one side to the other, yes? So this is a mathematical form of gluing. So whenever you see uh, bimodules uh, being tensored, what you have is really some uh, pieces of space which are gluing. Yes, but it's exponentiated space. Remember that you have this for, uh, for uh, the additive part when uh, two vector bundles, two sections match on the intersection of two sets. Yes, this is uh, the place of, uh, of that. Here, this is a space of the boundary. So you have a, a piece of boundary. This is, this is what, what the gluing does. You'll see, however, let me uh, tell you, it's a very good question. You'll see that from the meaning of the interior of the piece. Ah, uh, uh, yes, uh, it, it's a good question. Uh, uh, this, I think, the physics, in the, from the point of view that I am thinking, you'll see that fragments actually are a piece of such, bound, of such a boundary. So let me uh, come back to that in about uh, 10 minutes. Yes. Now, if we have some boundary, and remember this could be in any number of dimensions, so if we have now V1, V2, 
v3, v4, v5. Yes, and we have the inside here, some manifold M. Uh, what does the filling do, mathematically, by the way? So let me take an, uh, an eraser here and uh, yes. Oh yes, absolutely. Those could be smooth manifolds, but um, you see what happens is that, uh, so actually it was defined with smooth manifolds, I think uh, mathematically by Atia long time ago. And that, in my view, was a, was a problem on the long run because uh, it gave somehow the impression that you can uh, glue or you should glue only smooth pieces, yes? As you will see in this course, uh, the more singular the corner, the more information you have. So it's much easier to glue two smooth things than to match some corners, yes? And the whole uh, algebra, our whole structure will be at the corners. People started to recognize this in things like the Atiyah Singer Index theorem and so that, that if you restrict yourself only to, to gluing, it's, a, it's very serious and, and the interesting part is at the corners, yes? So the more singular the corner, the bigger the structure. Uh, as we'll see in this uh, simple-minded but uh, uh, model which, uh, which we'll uh, look at, these corners will be the actual particles. So, but what we'll have to do is a dictionary. So the QFT dictionary which is between topology as property of the space and uh, algebra. So what happens when you fill a polygon? You see, when you have the boundary, yes, it's a surface, empty, right? So there's not much that happens. What happens when you fill the boundary? Maybe uh, let's make it a little bit more interactive. Can you see topologically what happens to the boundary when you fill it? Hmm? Wonderful. That's exactly the thing. So once you fill it, the boundary shrinks to a point, yes? And conversely, if you shrink it to a point, then it describes a surface while it moves, yes? So the inside shrinks the boundary to a point. And algebraically, this should be C, yes? So it means that uh, it, it, uh, the inside gives you a map from uh, the Hilbert space of the boundary of M into C. Yes, and this function is called uh, Z from partition function, Z of the manifold. And alternatively, this is, uh, this can be viewed since these are, these are, uh, uh, Hilbert spaces, ZM is the inner product with some, uh, I have to learn to do physics inner products, with some vector zeta, where zeta M is in the Hilbert space of the boundary, yes, and zeta M contains the information on the inside. So taking the inner product with this vector would contract the boundary to a number. And these are among the most interesting uh, numbers in physics, the 3J and 6J symbols, so the Wigner, Raka, 
3j, 6j, and uh, uh, Klebsch, Gordon, symbols which you study in connection with angular momentum decomposition. These are exactly functions of this kind. Yes? So what we need is uh, such a map. So this map is uh, the, so zeta m contains information on the kind of matter. in the filling. So this is a kind of general setup, but we should go to a concrete thing. And I'd like to show you how some of the basic laws in mathematics, the uh, um, in particular, the Hopf algebra, which contains uh, uh, the structures of group, group duals, uh, quantum group, and so on, all can be read in the properties of a napkin of a square. Yes? So if you have a square, if you just look well enough at the square, you can derive those laws. So uh, one should prove something, even if just a lesson, so this is an, uh, just a moment. This should be. Oh, let me do it a little bit higher. Very good. So, um, let me give an example. First of all, uh, let me mention the, uh, the general structure, just in case uh, people are not familiar with it. The example here will be uh, G, let's say, is a finite group. But actually, this is a way too strong a restriction. And we take uh, the functions, functions on G. And uh, this space has laws as a uh, pointwise multiplication. And the evolution here is just a complex conjugate. And uh, V has also the convolution. And uh, this one would be a function f of g goes into f of g inverse conjugate. And uh, each of these can be made into a co-product by taking the layer dual. So if you have a map from V, from V tensor V, these are linear maps, V tensor V to V, you can map from V into V tensor V the corresponding linear dual. And uh, now, so you have more general laws of this kind. For instance, in this case, if you take the pointwise multiplication, that one is a billion. Yes, so you have similar laws in which both sides are non abelian. both non-abelian. And 
And uh, so the idea is that if we read it with this quantum field theory, we should be able to read exactly the structure of Hopf algebra up to the last uh, comma, all the laws. Uh, let me mention here before we, we uh, go that uh, the main axiom, and this is is that uh, the result does not depend on the cutting. That's the main property. So you get an equality, cutting uh, a body in uh, one way, the same body is cutting it in a different way. And it turns out that uh, mathematical laws, the ones that really work, arise this way. So that's what we'll do. Uh, so in, in order to, to uh, take a, uh, a napkin, according to this, it should be a boundary of something in 3D, yes? If you view it as a kind of rhombus, then there are two laws. You can take two of these things and put them one near the other, glue them like this, and then somehow eliminate the middle point. And the other law is exactly the same but you can put it in the other dimension, one on top of the other, and do exactly the same. And we'll show that these satisfy exactly these axioms. You glue them top to bottom, yes? Now, hmm? Yes, exactly like this, along both boundaries. Here, two pieces of the boundary, you remove the, the inner point and so on, yes? But let me first, before, uh, before that, let me sketch uh, the, uh, uh, let me sketch uh, here the even more and show what, what uh, they do. So let's take one dimensional bodies. Looks like a very trivial thing. Yes, so what we have in this case is a segment. So we have here a manifold M, yes, and this would give us a zeta M Yes, and here are two vector spaces, uh, P and Q. Let's call them one and two, yes. So this is V1 and this is V2. They do the gluing, yes. So we have a, a zeta M and we can uh, think of an operator P. It's the same P from V so let's write it here that zeta m is in v1 tensor v2, which is v of the boundary of m, yes? And can somebody uh, see uh, how we should improve a little bit this notation? Something about orientation. How about the orientation of the right point? as opposed to this. It's even in one dimension. Exactly, so one of them should have a bar, so this should be, uh, ah, actually, I am sorry, uh, Z, ZM, no. Uh, so this is good, that's why uh, there is 
what we have instead is that a vector in V1 tensor V2 is an operator that we'll call P from V2 bar into V1, yes? And now it's properly oriented. Thank you. Yes? So let's see what's the property of this. If we glue two of these segments, then that is a, uh, is a segment. And remember that it should, the result should not depend on what's inside, yes? So it's the same manifold. as this segment, yes? So it means that, and uh, also we have, we can flip it, yes, and get, uh, get the same. So this means that P square is equal to P star is equal to P. So P is an orthogonal projection, this P square. Yes, because that's a formula for, for gluing two operators is summing over an intermediate basis, right? Maybe I should detail it. So this is, uh, we have uh, the sum here, the sum of all, let's say, little v's. So we have the sum of all little v's in uh, v intermediate, actually over an orthonormal basis. of, uh, and let's put f as a test, we put here V1 and here V2. So this would be uh, P of, uh, P of uh, uh, V1 V times uh, V, P of V, V2. And this is exactly P square of V1, V2. Yes, so this should be something like this. Yes. So the operator is P square. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, let's see. Maybe it is. So, uh, yeah, actually, the projection is better if it's between the same spaces. Thank you very much. So this is this is indeed better. Yes, very good. Yes, yes. Wonderful. So uh, this way. Now, uh, what can? How can we solve a projection mathematically? What can you do to a projection? So you have a projection. Let's say you choose a basis. So you have the matrix of the projection. Yes, and the columns. Each column. This is P of uh, the vector E2 of the basis vector E2. Uh, so the columns generate the image. Uh, what can you do mathematically with that? It's something that you did in linear algebra. What's a computation? You have a bunch of vectors, and the interesting in spaces on which they project. What's the name? You have a bunch of vectors. What can you do to them? What computation? Hmm? It has a double name. Gram Schmidt, exactly. So you can do to this. So the uh, solving a projection is mathematically is a Gram Schmidt. And the Gram simply would give you here instead of this, let's say that the rank of uh, the rank of p, let's say, is equal to two. Then you will get two vectors, yes, two orthonormal vectors I which span the image, yes. So uh, now what you have this map is uh, is a map from v. to some new space, V0, yes? 
and uh, this is a, uh, a uh, more isometry, so a star from V0 to V is an isometry. It embeds V0 into V. We have decomposed the projection into two steps. One is a uh, is what's called a co-isometry, a star. So let's write it V. Our projection P is equal to, so P goes from V to V. You see this is P. This would be A star. So this thing is P. Yes, so P is equal to A star A, while A A star is the identity on V0. Yes, you have made many times this computation. And now let's see if you can see what's the corresponding uh, topological thing. Because we're in the business of translating things from topology into algebra. So you have taken a, uh, a projection and you did what? You. Well, Fortunately, I have brought some props here. You cut it in two, yes? <laughs> right? So your projection here from V to V, yes, was cut in two. So you have a new kind of point, V0. So a new, a new level zero, yes? And this operator is, it will be A, and it depends on how we orient it. If we, A, remember maps, uh, A is a co-isometry, yes? So A maps V into V zero, and here it would be also A if we put it like that, or A star if we orient it differently, yes? So you cut it in two. Now what's important here is that you have a new label Zero. So you can do now all kinds of computations with a new label. You see that this is uh, absolutely essential in higher dimensional computations. Now, Now why not start, uh, instead of a single label, to many label, with many labels? So these are called, uh, we call them types. So there are types. These are labels which match, need to match. And which can be forgotten if they are inside. So if they're in the interior, it shouldn't matter on what type we used, yes? But uh, when they're on the outside, they need to match. Yes, so let's take now several labels, points with labels I in I, yes, and uh, in this case, we'll have operators like this, I to J, so these would be operators EIJ, yes, and the property would be that EIJ times EJK for any J. These are not matrix units. You don't sum over the Js, yes? They need to match. We can even say that uh, 
Uh, this is uh, this should be Kronecker uh, of uh, J J prime. I'll just to make sure that algebraic uh, is a yes. So now you have these uh, these things, and the properties are that E i j star is equal to E j i. Yes, if you flip it, and uh, this is a property of gluing, right? This is clear. Yes. And uh, how do you solve such a system? In particular, e e i i. Let's take uh, one is in i, and zero is not in i. Yes. In this case, e one one is a projection. And just like before, we write e one one. We put a new label. Zero. Yes, which was exactly the one that we had before when we did the Gram Schmidt. And now we write that E11 is equal to E10 times E01. Yes. And now we define E by J. We don't define it. This is actually the property of E i j is that this is by those equations it's exactly E. Uh, I uh, one times E one zero times E zero one times E one J. So this one is by definition E I zero, and this one would be then E zero J. Yes. So this is the procedure that we we'll call enrichment. And uh, so now we have a new label zero. Uh, let me go a little bit fast over what happens in the case of an algebra. We'll do it rigorously later. Yes? Ah, that's a, that's a, that's a very good question. E zero zero, yes. Uh, so we'll keep in mind that E zero zero is an identity. You see, that's a, that's a thing. So, so when we have a bunch of projections, yes, we have enriched it with a new label with a property that E zero zero will be the identity. We'll see how this this works. Uh, you see, algebraically, E zero zero is the identity. Yes. So, uh, what's a property? Uh, well, algebraic. Again, this is the identity. You'll see the, the way we use this is that we'll build some matrices. So we'll put uh, a segment times anything in higher dimensions. Yes? For instance, a surface. And we'll build this way Hilbert spaces for surfaces with and without punctures and so on. So this is a picture. Now, let me uh, mention here, yes, what would happen in the case of 2D sketch. So here, the basic unit will be a triangle. Yes. And as you can see, the map here will be from V1 tensor V2, let's orient them like this, to V3. Yes. So you'll have a map from V1 tensor V2 to V3. And can you see what structure that would be? Uh, the hint is that the thing that we divide in two, two ways is V1, V2, V3, and this goes to V4. This can be divided one way or another. Yes, so this, let's say that for this time, the spaces are the same. So it's V tensor V to V, yes? And what is the property from here? This is a, a structure which is very familiar, yes? It's associativity here. So this is associativity. So this structure is an algebra. And since we have a uh, 
the trace of any element, this would be a Hilbert algebra. Can you see how to take the trace of an edge topologically? Yes, which is exactly, so this would give you the trace. Yes, this is V. If you fill this loop, this would give you, this would map V into C, and this is a trace, yes? And you can check properties, you can check that this is a, uh, an algebra with a trace, yes? Uh, so check uh, very easily that the trace of AB is equal to the trace of BA. What would be the picture for that? Yes, it's a circle with two points, which you get like this. You take this, you contract this to a point, yes? So you contract this edge to a point. So this goes from V tensor V to V, yes? Then you take the trace here, right? And you can neglect this, and then what you get is a space with a point, and this is V and this picture is obviously symmetric, so the trace of AB is equal to A. Yes? So now fast, let us uh, uh, see the laws here. Now I have brought here one uh, a prop. Yes? So here's how you do the composition. Oh, I hope it still works, yes. There, you see, so this thing gives you the product of two squares, yes? With the result, the third one. Uh, maybe for the mathematicians here, what uh, mathematical beast is this with respect to our triangle? Yes, yes. Can you see the triangle first? Uh, no, well, it depends. Uh, when you start, it's hollow. Uh, can you see the triangle from there? Where's the triangle? The triangle? Well, this is what uh, this course will do for you. You see, you will look at the wall and get a mathematical law out of it, yes? <laughs> and the theorem, if you, if the wall has it's of two, two kinds of paving. So you see the triangle is the equator here, yes? And this is called what in topology? The suspension, the two-point suspension of a triangle, yes? So you see, the moral of this is that lower dimensional topological structures appear in the higher ones. Yes? So this is a two-point suspension of a, uh, of a uh, triangle, yes? This is a two-point suspension, yes? Of a triangle. So it means from there that uh, we have the law of the triangle, yes, as long as we keep the same shape. So each of these laws will be how from there? What you see there, it's a, yes, it's a multiplication. It's an associative algebra with a trace, yes? In this direction, but also in this one, yes? So you see you have two laws on the same space, on the square, yes? Both of them are associative algebras with a trace, yes? But uh, the Hopf algebra structure is that one should respect the other. And in the last three minutes, I'm going to show you if this computer will work, which uh, may just happen, yes? We shall show here the uh, lower the, uh, the, the middle screen. 
Yes. So uh, this, by the way, is a preview of what we'll do next time in which we'll show that uh, we'll introduce particles actually uh, as Feynman diagrams out of higher dimensional uh, QFT. But instead, let's look now in Mathematica at some uh, simple animations. Ah, do you see, this is a law uh, of uh, Hopf algebra. You see, so it was arrived by people after long, long efforts. Uh, Algebraists keep the laws which work. So here's, how do we do this multiplication here? We do it with this, yes? With a double, uh, with a two-point suspension. So here's, uh, here's how we do it in each place, yes? And then we glue the surfaces together. And then, of course, the inside does not matter. That's what we get, yes? And you see this one decomposes. This one is a single thing that we, it decomposes into two double pyramids. Can you see them? So this is exactly the law here that uh, the one co-product respects the other product, yes? And as you see, this is done by gluing the space. Once again, these are, this is a co-product. We'll show it again, maybe next time. And this one decomposes this way, yes? And if we put the two together, the, uh, the thing that, K, that uh, arises a skeleton is actually the K3 graph for mathematicians, a complete graph, by bipartite graph with three and three points, yes? So I think that the picture is fundamental and we should uh, talk to uh, people, to our colleagues in algebraic geometry or so, if they have anything which has a singularity, the graph K33. And now the more interesting part so once again, the statement is that the complement of the graph K33 decomposes into exactly six double pyramids, which are the algebraic laws for the Hopf algebra. And now in the last minute, the last picture, uh, the Hopf antipode. So the antipode law says the following. You take a coproduct, so you go from one space, from one rhombus into two, yes? You take the coproduct. Then you glue one part with the identity and the other part with a rotation with 180 degrees, which is the antipode. So the antipode in Hopf algebra is taking a napkin and rotating it with 180 degrees. And what you should get is this is a unit, one, and epsilon is a co-unit. So something basically trivial. And look what happens if you glue them with a twist. Look at the twist, yes. You see you glue them with a twist. What you get here, once you neglect the interior, can you see this is a two-gone, yes? And remember the two-gone is a trace. If these are irreducible objects, they are the maps from A to A. Yes, and we'll have to prove it. We have a couple of things to left to, to prove in the general theory that a two-gone shrinks because it's a map from an irreducible object to another one. And you know that the maps from an irreducible to another one are just the scalars, yes? So basically this shrinks, yes? And you see what you get is a two-point suspension of our little loop, yes? which is exactly one of them is a unit and the other is the core, the core unit, yes? So you see again the knotting of the space simply gives you the most complicated law in Hopf algebra, the relation between, co -pro, between uh, the product, co-product and the antipode, yes? So basically we have uh, proved this way that if you look at a simple napkin, square napkin very carefully, you can read in it the 
the uh, most elaborate, the richest uh, mathematical law, yes? Uh, 